today. Um, I'm Marilyn Badevik, Executive Director of the Colorado Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. And today's webinar on the proposed um, traceability rule, we thank you for joining us. Um, we hope that it will provide an opportunity for growers to have input on this proposed rule and to learn more about it. Just a word about CFEGA. We are the go-to resource for Colorado's fresh fruit and vegetable farmers. We connect Colorado growers with industry, government, academia, consumers to strengthen and expand Colorado's fresh fruit and vegetable industry. We'd invite you to visit us at our website, coloradoproduce.org. And we're also on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and LinkedIn. I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors um, for 2020. Our platinum sponsors include John Deere, uh, the Four Rivers Equipment folks, Western Growers. In the category, we have Agfinity, American Ag Credit, Food Maven, and Cicada Farms. Silver sponsors include Aquatic Industries, or excuse me, Aquatic Resources, Bijou Seeds, Certus, Colorado uh, Potatoes, Decade Products, Deline Box, DeSante Farms, Fagerberg Produce, Gow and Company, Holler Seeds, Hiracata Farms, Farm Credit, Keith Lee Williams, King Supers, Landmark Packaging, Millburger Farms, Montview, or Monta Vista Co-op, also Nature Safe, NetFM, NMZ and J&J Supply, Organics, PSL Law Group, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, Seedway, Strohauer Farms, Target, Packer, and Packaging, Valley Irrigation, Western Sayre, and Whole Foods. Just a couple of housekeeping issues before we get into the webinar. Um, it is highly unlikely, but in the event of a disruption, we will attempt to remove the perpetrator. But if this fails, we would end the webinar and reschedule it. During this presentation, you can use the Q&A button to submit your questions. And to, um, if you're watching, you can optimize your viewing um, in the Zoom window. Just click exit full screen at the top right of your Zoom window and drag it to fit your viewing preference. At the end of the webinar, we will conduct two polls to get your feedback, and these will appear as a pop-up pop window. Indicate yes or no for each question. Do note that polling results will not be visible in the recorded version of this webinar, and yes, we are recording this. Today's webinar recording will be posted to the CFBGEA website, coloradoproduce.org, under the resources tab, and then choose food safety. In addition to our presenters uh, today, who I'll introduce um, shortly, we have participating in today's webinar several individuals who are experienced in various facets of food safety. They are available to answer questions today or at another time. And so I'll just very briefly introduce them. Martha Sullins uh, is CSU Extension Specialist for Ag and Business Management. And she also is co-chair of CFBGA's Food Safety Committee. Welcome, Martha. Christy Dice is CSU Produce Safety Specialist. Um, we also have Eduardo Gutierrez Rodriguez, who is Assistant Professor of Fresh Produce Safety at CSU. Now I'd like to introduce our uh, presenter today. Uh, she is a partner at the PSL Law Group with offices in Boulder, Colorado. In addition to her law degree, she holds a Master's of Science in Agricultural Economics from Virginia Tech. 
Her passion is food and agricultural law. She assists agriculture and food clients with regulatory compliance, including the Food Safety Modernization Act. She's very familiar with Colorado produce, having served for three years on CFVGA's board of directors. We are very pleased to have Jenny Lamb Rogers present what she thinks growers need to know about the proposed traceability rule. Jenny. Thank you so much, uh, Marilyn. I really appreciate the kind introduction and it is a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, so we're here to talk about the uh, FDA uh, FISMA proposed tr food traceability rule and really the essentials of what I think growers need to know now. Um, our goals for today are to provide um, a background. Oops, I just realized that I am sharing one second. Sorry about that. I am sharing the wrong version of the PowerPoint. So eh, technical glitch. Sorry about this, everyone. I have multiple versions of this open. All right, we're good. So, Apologies, everyone. Um, Jenny just notified us that her computer's crashed. She's going to try to pull it back up. So if you can hold on in the meantime, um, apologies, that is technology. So um, if you do have any questions in the meantime, just type those in uh, and we'll try to get um, some answers for you. We can use our time to do that. All right, I think we're back. I am so sorry about that, everyone. Um, you know, I feel like we all live on Zoom these days and 
every once in a while, something like that is bound to happen. I tried, I had two versions of um, the document open and tried to click out of one and it just crashed my entire computer. So let's um, uh, get back to it. So I have to start out with a disclaimer um, because I am an attorney and really this, um, this particular rule in the food traceability rule does cover a lot of sensitive information. And um, one of the reasons that many growers are concerned about this rule and is that it does require quite a bit of information sharing up and down the supply chain. And I just have to tell you that as an attorney that this uh, presentation doesn't create an attorney client relationship and um, is not legal advice, but I am really here today because I've been living and breathing this proposed rule and participating in every FDA public meeting on this rule and, um, and, and it's just, I'm deeply immersed in it and feel that it would, it's very important for growers to understand and to have an opportunity to ask questions and to really get your feedback to the um, CFEGA Food Safety Committee so that we can draft an effective set of comments and hopefully um, get a better rule that uh, growers can understand, implement, and ultimately uh, meet the goal of food safety. So our goals for today are to provide, provide a background on the history of the rule and its scope, um, identify what produce will be subject to this proposed rule, um, show how this proposed rule is really designed to work, uh, explain uh, the record keeping requirements of the rule, recognize the limited exemptions, uh, discuss the CFBGA Food Safety Committee's plans for developing and submitting comments on the rule, and then really, again, ask for your feedback. And um, if you will sign up one-on-one -on -one to meet with one of the Food Safety Committee members so that we can ask you some open-ended questions and then uh, really draft some effective comments from the CFBGA uh, to hopefully get a better and more workable rule. So the history and uh, the scope of this proposed rule, uh, it is the last mandatory rule from the Food Safety Modernization Act, which was signed uh, into law on January 4th, 2011. So here we are almost 10 years later. Uh, it comes out of section 204 of the Food Safety Modernization Act. And this section required FDA to commission a series of pilot projects for food traceability and then ask the FDA to designate a list of certain high-risk foods based upon foodborne illness outbreak data from the CDC. Uh, so the, the directive to the FDA was then to give those foods certain additional record keeping requirements that were technology neutral, science-based, and scale appropriate with the aim of hopefully having more effective trace back from the retailer all the way back to the farm or the originator of products that have been so associated with major foodborne illness outbreaks. Uh, the timeline for this rule has been quite delayed. Uh, the original list was required to be proposed within the FISMA statute within one year, um, and then the proposed rule within two years, and here we are about a decade on. Uh, the Center for Food Safety sued the FDA for failing to issue this rule, and then the rule was issued this September on a court order deadline. Um, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pressure on the agency to get this rule out in its final form because it has taken so long uh, to develop and to bring into fruition. Um, it is absolutely the broadest FISMA rule to date. And when I say broadest, I mean in terms of who it actually covers. Um, from the statutory directive, it includes persons and not just farms and facilities. So when we think about um, how the FDA regulates and how FDA has jurisdiction, it's typically been confined to facilities that prepare, pack, and hold food for human consumption and to farms that grow food. Um, but this rule is really different in that it will uh, reach distributors, restaurants, and retailers and have them be required to keep 
uh, records for traceability based on what they have received from entities uh, preceding them in the supply chain. Uh, the comment deadline for this rule was actually just extended this morning, and comments are due on February 22nd, 2021. So the first thing that this rule does is it establishes the food traceability list. And again, this list was established based on um, CDC data and really FDA looking at categories used in the registration of food facilities. And for many stakeholders, uh, these, these categories have been a little controversial and problematic um, because they are quite broad and they're not well-defined. I think it's a little bit more straightforward when it comes to produce. Um, and this list here is basically the produce that is covered. So cucumbers, fresh herbs, so parsley, thyme, cilantro, um, leafy greens, romaine, um, melons. Uh, one of the interesting issues is that it also includes watermelon, um, even though most of the foodborne illness outbreaks have been associated with melons that have a, a rougher surface, such as cantaloupe. Um, peppers, sprouts, tomatoes, uh, tropical tree fruits, and all fresh cut fruits and veggies. Um, and then if you go to look at the rule, it'll just say all fresh cuts fruits and fresh cut fruits and veggies, but there is a later exemption for all uh, fresh cut fruits and veggies that are not customarily consumed raw. So if you are doing cut potatoes to become french fries or if you are taking sweet corn off of the cob just like those uh, vegetables are not covered under the produce safety rule and the and because they appear on the not customarily consumed raw list they would not be covered by um, this proposed food traceability rule but even still, this list covers a lot of produce that is grown by, by Colorado growers and will impact a number of growers within the state. Um, I did include tropical tree fruits on here because if you happen to be a farm that does some business by importing um, tropical tree fruits or bringing in even um, tropical tree fruits from the southern part of the United States, and then sells those, you will still have these same um, food traceability uh, rule requirements. So I think it's important to recognize the full scope of produce. And then there are a number of additional food categories, but given that we are CFBGA, we're gonna focus on produce today. So the second thing, in addition to this list that FDA does is that it defines key data elements to be collected during all critical tracking events. So the FDA basically went through um, the supply chain from farm to fork and defined critical tracking events of when are there are these key times when information can be added and changed that's relevant to food safety that we need to know um, from looking at the very last stop um, in the production line at, at really the retailer level um, to be able to do an effective trace back investigation and get back to the source. So the critical tracking events were defined as growing, receiving, creating, transforming, and shipping. Um, most growers of produce on the food traceability list will be doing um, growing and shipping and may be doing receiving. And I say that as most growers, um, because really this is growers who are regulated as a farm under the current FDA definition of a farm and not growers who are regulated as a food facility. Um, if you are a grower who registers with the FDA, not with the Department of Agriculture, um, with the FDA, as a food facility, then it may be that you are doing growing, receiving, creating, transforming, and shipping activities. And really what this rule does is it layers responsibility for every activity that you do. So there are certain, th uh, certain key data elements you have to collect for growing 
certain key data elements you have to collect for shipping, certain key data elements you have to collect for receiving, and then you're responsible for passing on all of that information to the next entity in the supply chain. So to give you a visual of how this works, um, this is a graphic taken directly from the FDA's webpage on this proposed food traceability rule. And it's uh, modeling a fresh cut romaine supply chain. So that produce processor is making like a bagged salad um, romaine. And then uh, where we're going to focus in our discussion today is really on the farm level. So you can see here where we have the grower um, of, the, of the original whole romaine. Um, they're responsible for their grower KDEs. And then what's envisioned here, it looks like, is that you have a primary production farm. So if you recall that definition from um, the produce safety rule trainings, the primary production farm is where the products are actually grown on the site um, and harvested on site. And then this product is shipped to a secondary activities farm um, and cooled. Um, so that secondary activities farm is then responsible for, re for recording the receiving KDEs and the shipping KDEs. And then I think this is where this example gets a little bit weird because um, without packing, apparently, the, or maybe with packing, the, um, the, this entity is then sending on to an on-farm packer, um, so another secondary activities farm, and then they're responsible for having the receiving KDEs from their preceding entity and the shipping uh, KDEs outgoing. Um, and then they should still have the information from the grower KDEs. Then all of that information is supplied to the first receiver. Um, the first receiver has additional information that they have to collect um, in addition to the uh, yellow receiving KDEs for the farms. Um, the, the receiving KDEs that are similar to the farms, transformation KDEs, so basically um, more information for when they're taking the romaine and they're actually chopping it and transforming it into a different product, and then they're shipping KDEs. And then ultimately that product goes to the distributor. They have to collect receiving and shipping KDEs. And then finally, the retailer um, has to maintain receiving KDEs. So I know that was a lot and you don't know what these KDEs are, but I wanted you to get a picture of the, how this, these responsibilities build through the supply chain um, before we go in and talk about each one of those key data elements that growers are likely to be responsible for. So in getting into that discussion, we really have to focus on some uh, core concepts and definitions. So when I say farm, um, I mean farm in the same uh, rather problematic definition we have from the produce safety rule, which, as I mentioned, includes that primary production farm where the products are grown on site, the secondary activities farm that is um, receiving product from another farm and then packing or cooling that product. Um, when I say problematic. Uh, we've had many discussions, um, CFVGA, Food Safety Committee members, um, regulators, um, really the, the entire produce community about um, problems with the definition of the secondary activities farm in that the secondary activities farm definition has an ownership requirement where the majority of the produce um, packed has to be owned by the same entity that, um, uh, that, that grew the produce, basically. So there's a 50% uh, majority ownership requirement, and that really doesn't re reflect the reality of many packing house operations where a lot of the produce that comes into um, a facility is not owned by the same entity that owns the packing house. So under... <laughs> 
under the current farm definition, um, if they don't meet that 50% um, requirement, they're technically required to register as a food um, facility. Um, but FDA, since January 2018, has been exercising enforcement discretion, saying that even if you don't meet the ownership requirement, you can still be regulated as a secondary activity farm and has been treating those entities as secondary activities farms, but hasn't carried that over to this rule. And that gets, gets challenging when we think about how this, uh, these requirements map on to um, the, the how the food traceability rule requirements map on to produce supply chains. Uh, the second like major concept to be aware of is this idea of a first receiver. And the first receiver is basically the first non-farm entity to receive produce that is listed um, on uh, the food traceability list. So it is that produce processor or distributor that receives um, produce in most cases. Um, then we really get into what the key data elements are um, and uh, we'll just walk through these definitions. So the first is a traceability product description and really think about that as the commercial description of the product that's used for stocking or selling um, by a distributor or a retailer. So it's when the retailer comes to you and say, I want to buy, um, you know, clamshell tomatoes, um, that would be uh, the traceability product description. Uh, the traceability product identifier would be an alphanumeric code assigned to um, that whole kind of product description category. Then we have the traceability lot code. And the traceability lot code is a descriptor, um, typically will be alphanumeric, um, assigned to a particular lot of product. So when we talk about traceability in our produce safety rule um, trainings, we'll talk a lot about uh, the last clean break and really defining your lots by product that came from a certain field and was packed during a certain time um, or cooled and packed during a certain time and then cutting off the lot so that in the event of a recall, you can hopefully limit the scope of the recall. So I want you to really connect the traceability lot code with that um, lot definition. Um, then we also have location description information. This is a complete physical address, key contact information, um, specifically the business name, physical location name, phone number. So really the details for getting in touch um, with the operation that is carrying out a critical tracking event. And then a location identifier, which is another unique identification code um, an entity assigns to that location description. Um, and then a very common abbreviation used throughout the rule um, in defining these key data elements is a POC, which is just a point of contact or the name of the responsible individual. And I think these are the most important definitions to get the base understanding of this rule, but um, this rule is challenging and complex in the fact that it introduces so many new terms that uh, FDA has created a glossary um, for this rule. And so I have a, a link there to the FDA glossary um, with um, FDA's more legalese definitions than the ones that I've put up there. So our first set of key data elements um, are farm, are the farm like growing KDEs. And so when you would need to collect this is if you grow one or more types of produce on the food traceability list. Uh, then you need to generate a traceability lot code linked to the growing area coordinates for each um, grown FTL food. So if you grow um, cilantro, cucumbers, and, um, uh, and, and mix and, and red leaf lettuce, then you would need to have um, the, grow the actual GPS coordinates for each of those linked to a lot code um, for each of those products. 
Second, if you're going to sell any product at all, you likely will have farm shipping KDE requirements. Um, so this is you sell or ship one or more types of produce on the food traceability list from your farm. So the first thing that you have to provide to the next link in the supply chain is a statement that you are a farm under the FDA definition of farm. And given the amount of time that I've spent analyzing for different organizations over the past few years, whether they are a farm or not, um, that is easier said than done under the current definitions. Um, then you also need to have a location identifier and location description for the originator of the food. So if that's not you, um, in many cases, it's likely to be you if you actually are growing the produce that you are shipping out. Um, then you need the business name, point of contact, and phone number for the harvester of the food, if that's not you, and the date and time of harvesting. Um, we've had some internal discussions about times of harvesting really being problematic because most growers harvest over an interval of time. Um, so how FDA expects um, that information to be presented is really an unknown at this point. Um, you also need a location identifier and location description of the place where the food was cooled um, and the date and time of cooling. Again, time of cooling may be challenging with products being cooled on an interval. And then a location identifier and location description of the place where the food was packed and the date and time of packing. So this is a lot of um, detailed information that you need to now um, attach basically to that growing KDE and the growing KDE of the your geographic location of the field where it was grown and all this information has to go with the product um, when you um, sell to the next link in the supply chain. And a key item to note here is that the rule is written right now to be flexible so that a farm or a first receiver can assign the traceability lot code to all of the farm shipper information. So if you grow, you have to have a traceability lot code linked to GPS data, but you don't necessarily have to link all of this information into that traceability lot code if you work out with the next entity in the supply chain that they're going to be generating the traceability lot code. So, um, perhaps positive in that it's flexible, perhaps negative in the sense that the responsibilities really aren't clear and it leaves um, something, it leave, creates an element of doubt in how you actually resign responsibility within the supply chain. Um, last, we have the farm receiving KDEs. Um, this may or may not apply to you if you are a farm, um, but really who this would touch would be a primary production farm or a secondary activities farm where you either purchase um, produce that's on the FTL from someone else and then you sell that along with your own product or you meet that secondary activities farm definition where you're not actually growing product on site but you are packing or cooling for another entity. And for now, you meet that ownership requirement that we discussed as well. And the farm receiving KDEs are uh, listed right in the location identifier and location description for the immediate previous source. And it says immediate previous source because you could have multiple farms preceding you if you're in, that, in the business of purchasing from a number of different farms or even just packing for a number of different farms. Um, the entry number, if you have imported food, again, this would be the situation where maybe you import some mangoes from Mexico that you then go ahead and ship with all of your product um, from your operation in Colorado. Um, the location identifier and location description for where the food was received and the date and time of receipt. Uh, quantity and unit of measure of the food. So, you know, however um, the produce is actually packed. Um, trace, uh, the traceability product identifier, the location identifier and location description for the lot code generator. So um, likely that's going to be um, the farm from which you received that product. Um, reference record types and numbers where the information is stored. So one of the items um, 
requirements under the uh, FISMA statute in 204 is that FDA can't make you duplicate records or can't make growers duplicate records. Um, so if you're already collecting this information, then you basically have to make a key to say, so the FDA has a way of figuring it out from the record types where you're already storing the information. And then finally, um, that received product has to come in from a transporter and you have to keep a record of the name of the transporter. I mean, we do have a so, question in the chat. Yeah. Um, uh, the question is, is the packing house considered a non-farm entity, i.e. first receiver, or would that depend on if the packing house is owned by the same farm? So the pack, it depends on whether you meet the definition for farm or not. And it, it, it's, it's hard to say without further information. It's why we really get into this very detailed analysis of do you meet the secondary activities farm or the primary production farm? Um, or do you have to go ahead and register as a food facility? So just to give you a quick example of I think a really common operation um, in Colorado, if you grow um, on and and you have like multiple fields in the same kind of general area. So, you know, you might have a couple of highways between or something like that. Um, and then you have um, a packing house on your farm in one part of the operation um, and you own the packing house and you own the product, then you likely meet the definition of the primary production farm and would not need to register that facility as a food facility. Now, where it gets complicated is if you actually, if you take that packing house and you start packing for 10 other people, um, right now, uh, unless those 10 other people have a majority interest in your packing house, and I doubt that they do, you wouldn't meet the definition of being a, of being a primary production farm anymore. And you would technically have to register as a food facility. But since 2018, again, FDA has been exercising enforcement discretion on that particular issue um, and has been treating all entities who do that just like a farm and not like a registered food facility. So hopefully that helps, but it, it really gets into this issue of why we say the pro farm definition is problematic and why it's really problematic to this rule. Thanks, Christy. So just to walk through um, an example of how these, um, how these KDEs really apply to a relatively simple example here. So we start with a primary production farm um, and actually, this could be the example that I that I really just gave. So the farm here um, would keep the growing KDEs and that they have to have the GPS coordinates for every single field. Um, and then they are shipping to another, um, to a secondary activities farm or to a primary production farm. And then they're packing in the on-farm cooler. Um, and uh, and then they would have to collect the date and time of cooling, the date um, they would have to get from the farm, the date and time of harvest, and they'd have to get the date and time um, of receipt, basically. So all those receiving KDEs, they'd have to get the um, growing KDEs, and then they'd have to generate the shipping KDEs and give that to the distributor. The distributor would then be the first receiver and they could either take the um, pro, uh, traceability lot code that was assigned um, by the on-farm cooler or by the farm, um, or they can generate their own traceability lot code and then, um, uh, and then ship the product to the retailer and then and the distributor would be responsible for the receiving KDEs and the shipping KDEs. And then the retailer only responsible for the receiving KDEs. Um, mangoes, uh, this is a more complex example from the FDA. And I know that mangoes aren't 
um, incredibly relevant to Colorado produce, but I do think it's a relevant example to think about. So you could just think about it as it is not necessarily even being um, mangoes in this example, but um, farm one produces mangoes. They're a smaller operation rather than um, have to work through the entire supply chain and selling to um, a distributor themselves. They just sell to another larger farm. That larger farm aggregates the product and sells the product on to an on-farm packer and cooler. Um, you would keep and generate each of the KDEs at every single step. Um, and then the entity that actually is the first receiver in this chain, um, which is responsible for making sure that the traceability lot code is assigned, um, would be, in this case, the importer wholesaler, but you could also think of them um, as a distributor. It's basically the first non-farm entity. Um, and then the retailer is responsible for the receiving KDEs. So in addition to the, these kind of building responsibilities for all of these KDEs that you have to keep track of, you are required to keep a description of your reference records. So um, one of the challenges that FDA has run into during traceback investigations is that um, the, they'll receive all of the records within 24 hours, but they have no way of making sense of what these records actually do. So this is a, basically a description of what records you keep and where the key data elements are embedded within them. Um, so that FDA has a key to be able to um, effectively uh, carry out a traceback investigation. Uh, you also have to have a list of all the FTL food that you ship um, at all times. So this is really a fairly complicated exercise for a diversified grower, or if you buy and sell a lot of produce in addition to produce that you actually grow, um, because every time you think about purchasing more produce, you're going to have to go through and figure out, is that FTL produce? Do I need to collect all of these key data elements? And what many uh, commenters have pointed out is that really, even though this rule only applies to um, the FTL foods, the agency has, complete, has created such a complicated set of um, requirements for data collection that it's likely that you're going to move over your entire traceability system so that you just have one traceability system and not one traceability system for FTL foods and one traceability system for non-FTL foods. Uh, you also need to have a description of how traceability lot codes are assigned. I know during um, the PSR trainings that all of you have likely attended, um, we walk through the generation of a, of a pretty simple lot code. Um, that process is, is going to be more complicated under this proposed rule um, with the need to embed uh, GPS data and um, possibly with uh, first receivers pushing down the responsibility to assign a traceability lot code that's linked to um, the harvest date and time, packing, cool and time, uh, packing date and time, and cooling date and time. Um, and then any supplemental information necessary to understand the firm's traceability system. And I just really view this as a catch-all where FDA is, is, has become fed up with getting the data they requested and then not being able to do anything with it. Um, and so they've, they've basically built in this, we better be able to understand uh, the records that you give us um, to be able to carry out our traceback investigation. And if you didn't, don't give us sufficient information, that's on you, that's not on us. And that's, that's kind of a challenging place to be because how do you, how do you really know um, whether you've produced enough information to, to let FDA do its job? Um, and I certainly think that's something that we should raise in our comments. So uh, the rule also adds record retention form and availability requirements. So um, all of these traceability records must be available within 24 hours of a record requ request. They have to be maintained for two years and they need to be made available in, a, in an electronic and sortable spreadsheet within 24 hours of the FDA request. And 
this last piece is quite, I think will be quite challenging for many growers where they have a hybrid of um, paper-based and electronic systems. Um, and because if you aren't keeping all of this data um, in some, some electronic form already, generating one of those spreadsheets within 24 hours is a really challenging task. And um, have had a, I've had a front row seat to that in, in several outbreak um, investigations. So um, even though the rule is meant to be technology or is prescribed to be technology agnostic, uh, the FDA is prescribing that it has to be an electronic and sortable spreadsheet. So at the bare minimum, you have to have an Excel file with all of this information um, within 24 hours. Uh, the rule offers very limited farm exemptions um, from these general requirements. So uh, one exemption is for listed foods that receive certain types of processing or a kill step. And this follows the commercial processing exemption of the produce safety rule. Um, so canning, cooking, juicing, pasteurization, et cetera. Um, and this is as written in the statute and in the rule, a complete exemption. Um, but so if you solely produce tomatoes to go to a sauce manufacturer, in theory, you would be exempted from this rule. What's a challenging piece here is how, how will you absolutely know that you are exempted from the rule um, because the receiving entity um, won't necessarily have a label from you or information to conclude that you are truly exempt. So the details of this, I think, will likely have to come out in guidance, but we need to put forward comments to say, you have, FDA, please clarify how um, you're going to apply the commercial processing exemption so that growers aren't going to all of these extra steps for um, for products that are ultimately bound for a kill step. Um, there's also a whole set of requirements for foods later subject to a kill step. And the line between these two exemptions, I think is very unclear in the rule as written. Um, there is an exemption within the rule for farms with less than uh, 25,000 in produce sales. Um, this is the exact same as the produce safety rule calculation, so adjusted for inflation. Um, but as we all know, that's a pretty small threshold for um, uh, produce sales. There's also an exemption for farm direct sales to consumers. Um, but I don't want you to equate this to the qualified exemption in the produce safety rule where we go through, is it in the neighboring state? Is it within 500 miles, 500 miles of the crow fly? You know, that we've, we've all been through that qualified exemption exercise many times. This is much narrower than that. It has to be a farm direct sale to the consumer. So this is the, the roadside stand um, the, or you are taking your product directly to the farmer's market to avoid um, these additional uh, produce, uh, these additional food traceability rule requirements. Um, a few other farm exemptions. Uh, if you produce and package food on a farm in a fully enclosed in container that maintains the integrity of the product to prevent subsequent contamination, or alteration of the product, and the product gets to the consumer with your full name, address, and phone number of where the product was packed, then you don't have to record, um, and you don't have to collect all of these key data elements at every single critical tracking event. Um, but note that most produce packaging is not going to meet this requirement. Um, clamshells with holes, cardboard boxes, plastic bags with holes, netted bags, none of these would be eligible for this exemption because it's not uh, fully contained and fully enclosed um, uh, to, to prevent potential subsequent contamination of the product. Um, also, uh, produce that is really consumed raw is exempted here. So, and really, as we discussed at the beginning, that only uh, applies to the, uh, to the fresh cut section because otherwise the, the every other um, 
item of produce is uh, not on that rarely consumed raw list. Um, there's also a partial exemption that's straight out of the statute for farm to school or farm to institution sales. So um, the school food authority or the institution is really only required to document the name and address of the farm for 180 days. So they've, so FDA and Congress have dramatically simplified things and um, exempted you from the rule if that is your main customer. Of course, if that is only one of your customers, then um, you still will be needing to meet the uh, proposed food traceability rule requirements uh, for the rest of your customers, and that may not help you. Um, other parts of the supply chain also get limited exemptions. So transporters are not required to comply with any of these requirements, and FDA's justification for that is that um, in during traceback investigations, usually they, they're looking at the bill of lading from the distributor um, and from the farm. And so the transporter is recorded there, but the transporter just doesn't have that much useful information to give to them. Um, the rule also has a co-proposal for small retail food establishments where FDA has said we'll either give them a full exemption or a partial exemption. Um, and the partial exemption would keep the entire rule intact except for um, those small retail food establishments with less than 10 employees um, would not have to produce that electronic sortable spreadsheet. And the full exemption um, would, would take them entirely out of the rule. Um, there's also a very limited waiver process that's required by statute. Um, a waiver will only be granted for a showing of economic hardship. Uh, economic hardship um, examples given by the FDA are um, truly unique operations where it becomes impossible to record this information or geography, um, but things like low revenue or few employees would not qualify for a showing of economic hardship. Um, it is possible that FDA could grant a waiver for an entire type of entity. And um, if it were to do that, you'd have to file a citizen petition with the FDA. Um, for an individual entity, you can write a written request for a waiver. And then of course, FDA has maintained the authority to revoke a waiver if necessary. But I think um, reading between the lines here, it's going to be very difficult to get a waiver from this rule. And there are not nearly as many exemptions from this rule um, so that many qualified exempt growers under the produce safety rule are likely to be subject to this rule. Uh, finally, the rule sets uh, compliance dates. Um, in English, um, this rule will be final two years and 60 days after FDA publishes the final rule. Um, in terms of timing for that with the comment period closing on February 22nd, I would expect there will be thousands of comments submitted on this particular proposed rule, just like there were for the produce safety rule and um, for the preventive controls rules. Um, I, it'll probably be at least eight months to a year before FDA issues that final rule. But still, it's very hard to prepare for um, compliance with this rule until we see the final rule and know exactly what data needs to be collected here. Uh, so once that rule becomes final, two years and 60 days is going to seem like a pretty short period of time, I think. Um, the, the CFVGA Food Safety Committee has met, and uh, these are some of the key concerns that we've identified. Um, and Christy, you surfaced one right away with that Q&A um, during the presentation. Uh, the problem with relying on the existing farm definition, FDA has been saying for years now that it's going to revise the farm definition and has issued this enforcement discretion guidance, but what we have is still the farm definition and then this rule directly cites to the farm definition. And as we've run into here, it gets really complicated with growers and pack houses to know what their actual responsibility is going to be um, in terms of who's gonna generate the lot code um, and whether that pack house is gonna be a first receiver or not. Um, 
Uh, we discussed that there's a challenge here with no similar exemption as under the PSR um, for qualified exempt growers. Really, I mean, a lots and lots of medium-sized growers that produce these very popular products are going to be expected to comply with a very technically complex and challenging rule. Um, Another question we have is education by whom, how, when, and with what resources. Unlike uh, the produce safety rule and the establishment of the produce safety alliance and the approved curriculum for the produce safety rule to meet the education requirement in the rule, there is no education requirement in this rule. Yet we're talking about working with even smaller entities than are um, covered by the produce safety rule. And that's that's going to be really challenging for reaching uh, growers of all sizes, particularly. Um, we also feel that this is a very short timeline for compliance. Um, building a traceability program is, is challenging and difficult. And retooling a traceability program, as I think this rule is going to require a lot of operations to do, is likewise quite challenging. Um, we also have questions about how this rule will be enforced. Um, one of the, I think, great uh, victories for the produce safety rule is um, the really the partnership with NASDA and the fact that state departments of agriculture, for the most part, are um, responsible for actually doing inspections on produce operations. Um, but with this new rule, with farms being regulated, will it be departments of agriculture who are inspecting for compliance? or will it be FDA, or will this rule not be monitored for compliance at all, except for in the event of a foodborne illness outbreak? Um, some commenters have also raised questions about retailers. Um, technically, the FDCA only grants jurisdiction over food facilities. So how do you actually make sure that retailers meet their responsibilities under these rules? And these are questions that I think we definitely should raise in our comments. Um, the rule also requires very detailed collection of data, uh, not recorded, um, at least to our knowledge, in many farm traceability um, programs. Um, what we've uh, discussed as a group and what we look forward to your feedback on is commonly we see date and field being collected, but not time specific data. And uh, harvest and cooling intervals can span a significant period of time and there's just practical issues with how that gets recorded. And um, I think we would strongly encourage the FDA in our comments to really limit the scope of these key data elements to be collected to what you really need. What is the marginal benefit of collecting time data compared to date and location of harvest in terms of facilitating a traceback investigation? Um, we've also surfaced some concerns about confidentiality um, because right now with this uh, chain type sequence, um, codes in the geographic location of where that crop is grown and then that information is available to the rest of the supply chain. And if the intent of this rule is really for um, the effective uh, traceback, why can't there be protections for confidentiality where that farm specific data just gets provided to FDA and not the entire supply chain? Um, there's also significant variation in record keeping systems from paper based to electronic and um, even though this rule is meant to be technology agnostic, requiring a sortable spreadsheet does dictate um, that uh, there will have to be some increased technological literacy for some growers, and it could be way too simple for others. Um, so what can you do as a grower um, with this rule? Uh, first, I would encourage you to learn more about the proposed food traceability rule um, on the FDA website. FDA does have a lot of visuals. They did three public meetings on this rule um, with recorded presentations. I think those recorded presentations, just for my two cents, they, tend, they focus on the whole supply chain. So they're not nearly as specific to produce or to farms as this presentation is. I really drilled down into what the farm KDEs are. So um, 
I hope that this is a very helpful resource for you, but this is the broader context. Um, we really hope that you will sign up to give feedback to the CFEGA Food Safety Committee so that we can draft comments. Um, FDA has asked for feedback about specific supply chains and how the rule does or does not appropriately map onto those supply chains. And basically we can't say what is wrong with the rule effectively if we don't have uh, the examples to really bear that out. So um, we're going to ask you to sign up to meet one-on-one -on -one with a food safety committee member. We'll have some specific questions. We'll ask you to share your concerns. And then we will anonymize all of your data for sharing with the agency. It would just be basically this entity to this entity. Why is this problematic? How does this run up against the farm definition? Which is really what I think we're going to hit. Um, so third, uh, Western Growers um, is putting together a survey um, and, they're, and they're going to file comprehensive comments on this rule. Um, and it would be very helpful to Western Growers and to um, CFEGA if you can complete that survey. And then they've agreed to share the Colorado like aggregated data so that we could also include that in our comments, which would be a fantastic resource to supplement. So um, Marilyn will circulate that once the survey is developed. And then um, fourth, uh, or I guess we have two number threes, uh, to submit your individual comments using a grower form letter drafted by the F CFEGA Food Safety Committee. So what we're thinking with timeline with this uh, deadline just being extended is um, that the committee will meet uh, just after the first of the year We'll talk about our um, kind of basically form questions to really solicit or elicit information from you. Um, then try and schedule some of these calls to walk through to get feedback. And then based on what you say on the phone, um, we'll draft a letter that includes the concerns that we already have and any concerns you tell us. And then um, hopefully make this really user friendly for you. So you can just put in um, what produce you grow um, that will be impacted and any specific concerns you have and then submit to um, uh, regulations.gov, which is the federal register site um, before February 22nd, 2021. And I still have unless this deadline is extended. FDA has already extended it once. Um, very rarely will they do a second extension. So. Um, with that, uh, we can open things up for questions. Uh, I know you have been typing your questions into the Q&A box as we go. Um, we do have Chrissy and Eduardo and uh, Martha on the line. So um, if you have general food safety questions or you have questions about signing up or kind of feel free to kick a question to any one of us if you have questions um, about the particular rule, I will do my very best to answer them. Um, a lot of this, as you can see, is in development and there are things that we just don't understand. And so our process now is to get clarification on issues. So with that, I look forward to your questions. And thank you very much, Jenny, for unpacking that very complex proposed rule for us. And as you guys are typing in questions that you have, I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll um, from an educational point of view, if you wouldn't mind just clicking yes or no on that. I would appreciate it. And Jenny, there aren't any questions in the chat that we haven't answered and, and we didn't get any in the Q&A, just a heads up. Okay, I was, I was looking, I was like, really, are there no questions? Well. 
So we did just get one. They somebody's asking if the slides will be shared online somewhere. They will. I've provided a PDF copy of the slides for you to um, to, to browse. Uh, Marilyn will send them out to everyone who registered, and then they'll also be posted in the um, food safety section on the CFBGA webpage. Correct, Marilyn? Correct. Yep. And with that email, we'll also send that link for you to sign up for a uh, interview uh, with food safety committee member. I was really hoping there would be more questions. Um, is there any feedback about the rule? Are there any concerns? Um, is there anything that you need more information on? Um, help us help us help you. Uh, so any 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 comments would be welcome as well. Were there any comments? Oh, I see we have another question maybe. Uh, any comments from our panelists? So the, the question is the time issue could be a problem. How are we supposed to, uh, to keep track of that? And I, my response would be yes, absolutely. Um, I agree with you. I, I don't I don't know how you are expected to keep track of the time when a product is harvested, especially when product that will be in the same lot is likely harvested at different times throughout the day. So um, my encouragement would be, and, when, and what I have advised to the Food Safety Committee and to this group as a whole is to to really ask FDA to just remove the time requirement. I don't think that the time requirement is going to yield um, more valuable food safety information. And we'll see if um, the FDA grants that request or not. Um, but that's exactly the kind of feedback um, that we, we need that it's actually a grower concern and not a, um, not a lawyer or an extension concern um, with this rule. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I think we can go ahead and wrap things up. And yeah, please, please do sign up to chat with, chat with us. And um, we really hope that you will um, uh, go ahead and submit one of the form letters and and meet with us um, one on one. Again, we're. Our, our goal here is really just to get a better rule um, for the growers and so that there's clear guidelines on what you need to do um, under this rule. So we really appreciate your time and your participation and thank you so much. Thank you everyone.